when it is customary to do work on the ninth of Av, we may do it. Where it is customary not to do work, we may not do it. But in all places, scholars are idle. Reb Shimon ben Kamil says a man should always adopt the behavior of a scholar. But the Chachamim say in Judea, they used to do work on the eve of Pesach until midnight, while in the Galil, they did no work at all. As for the night, Ben, ben Shammai forbid work, while Beis Hillel permitted until sunrise. But Meir says, any work which began before the 14th, he may finish on the 14th. But he may not begin it initially on the 14th, even if he can finish it before midday. But the sages say, practitioners of three crafts may work on the eve of Pesach until midday. They are tailors, barbers, and launderers. Rabbi Yossi Bar Yehuda says, also shoemakers. We may set up coops of chickens on the 14th. If a brooding hen escaped, we may return it to her place. If she died, we may set another in her stead. We may sweep away from under an animal's feet on the 14th, but on the festival, we may only clear it away to the sides of the stall. We may take utensils to and bring them back from the house of a craftsman, even though they are not needed for the festival. Okay. Okay. So there were six non-halachic practices that, uh, that the people of Yericho did, three of which the Chachamim sort of just said, let it slide. And, uh, mm -hmm. and three of them, they said, uh -uh, we've, got to, we've got to reprimand them for this. So um, what, what's the relevance to our peric? Well, that's because the, um, because the first one has got to do with, um, has got to do with Pesach. So these are the ones where they let it slide. Markivin de Kalim Kolayom. They would they would graft their um, their palm trees all day. Now that was Kolayom, uh, which is Erev Pesach. So that's the that's the relevance of this Mishnah to our uh, to our Masechta is um, right. They were they were very busy with with um, you know in the area of Jericho. That's that's date palm country. So that was their, uh, and that was their uh, business the whole time. So they were busy uh, grafting, uh, grafting palm trees in order to improve them, and um, and and the delay of this, uh, de and delaying uh, of uh, Kahati points out that uh, delaying the uh, grafting even by one day could uh, could make could could spoil uh, uh, could spoil the fruit. So they would uh, be involved in this in this melacha also on erev Pesach, okay? And they said it's not a good thing, but we're not going to we're not going to complain about it. But korachin ishma, so korachin ishma, they would uh, the brisa in the Gemara explains that um, it explains the name of Rabbi Yehuda that they did not say baruch shem kavod malchus soli alam boed after after saying shma, they would just go straight into the avta. Okay, which is uh, you know obviously that's how it's written in the Sefer Torah, um, but uh, our, our our practice is to insert Baruch Shem Kavod into into the Shema. Nonetheless, Chazal didn't feel it necessary to reprimand them. The Kotshin Vegodshin Lifnei Omer. So now, what uh, you remember the Korban HaOmer comes to uh, comes to permit all of the uh, all of the produce. That's uh, that's growing this year, okay. Um, they, before that, you have it's called Chadash. After the Korban Haomer, it's uh, it's called Yashan. So now, uh, what they would do, what what is permitted, is to harvest the the produce before the Korban Haomer. However, you're not allowed to you're not you're not allowed to pile it up because once you start piling it, then it's then people are going to start accidentally eating from it. So Chazal gave permission for, to people to, to, to start the, the harvest before the Korban Omer, but not to, to start piling the produce. And the people of Yericho would also pile it uh, even, before the, even before the Omer. Nonetheless, they didn't feel it was uh, worthy of a reprimand. Elu shem once, you pile, hmm? once you pile it up, once you bring it in somewhere and pile it up, like in your home. Then it's, then it's Chayv and Trumas and Masters. Very good. Right. right. So... Okay, these are the ones where they did protest. So they uh, they permitted the, uh, the the soft branches that grew on the carob trees and on the and the sycamore trees 
um, they they permitted them to they put, permitted themselves to enjoy them, even though they were from Hekitesh trees. Okay, why? They, they, the justification that they gave themselves was that our, our, our you know our ancestors um, didn't uh, sanctify the trunks of the of the trees because the because uh, the only reason why they, they sanctified it was because there were robbers who were coming and stealing the, the branches of the trees. Okay, so they announced that they were now hektish in order to prevent robbers from coming and, uh, and taking them. But the soft branches that, uh, um, that, 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 that are sprouting from them afterwards are not, are not asa because of hektish, it's only the trunks. That are asa because of hektesh, so, so the robbers don't come and cut down the trees. Okay. Um, Rambam has a slight, that, that, that was Rashi's explanation. Ram, Rambam gives a different explanation. He says that they used to permit themselves to eat the, the things that grew out of hektesh trees and said that only the, 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 the fruit wasn't what was uh, what was asa to us. Um, uh, it's only the fruits that are that are going to be um, that are going to be hektesh, but what uh, grows in the field is uh, uh, afterwards is mutar. So they would tell them, that, and this is the rationalization. Chachamim said you cannot do this, they pr and they protested about it. Second thing they used to do was ochin um, mitachas hanisharim b'shabbos. That's um, they would they would eat fruit that had that had, that had fallen that they found uh, fallen under a tree on Shabbos. Now the problem with that is that if it's uh, if it fell on off the tree on Shabbos, that's that's mukta. It's uh, it's it's basically nolad on on Shabbos, and uh, and you're not allowed to you're not allowed to eat that. If they had a safek, they would go lahakel. And uh, and so they would say, oh, maybe it fell before Shabbos, and then they would permit themselves to eat it. They, Chachamim found out they were doing this and they protested. Um, and they would, they, this sounds like a, like a Chumrah. It sounds like they, would, they, were being, uh, they, were, they were being extra nice by, by taking their vegetable fields and leaving a payer from it. Now, remember we say about payer, is, one of the qualifications for payer is that it has to be things that get, that get put into storage. And the vegetables don't get put into storage. Um, so, so therefore, they are exempt from payer. Okay, so nice. They, so they left a corner of the of the of the uh, cucumber fields for uh, uh, for the onion. What's the problem with that? Well, uh, I don't know if, you, if, if cucumbers are, are counted as yarak, but let's, let's say. That, um, but whatever it is, it was something that's not the chayven payer. They left a they left a, a corner of the field over for the onion. What's the problem with that? Go on, you can tell me. I want to look at the corner of the field payer. Where's the kula? Chachamim are going to say you can't do this. There must be a kula somewhere. What? What? And what is that going to be? Oh, sorry. I... Trimus and masters. Oh, that, oh, oh, I didn't think that was going to be read it. Yeah, no, because what happens is in a, in a real payer daraisa, the aniyim right. come and take the produce. They don't have to give trimus and masters. Real. If it's okay. if it's a real payer, then there's no there's no truma and maser on what the aniyim take. Right, we said that before. Right, okay. So, so now, now... What the, so now if the aniyim are coming and taking this this payer, which isn't really payer, it's basically just a gift to them from the farmer. Then it's still chayv and trumas and masters, so they're causing the aniyim to be nichshal on trumas and masters. Okay, All right. which would have been different if they just declared it hefker. Then hefker is no trumas and masters again. But right. what they're doing is saying this is payer, and and it's not really payer, which means that only the but and also by saying it's payer, they're also saying that only aniyim are allowed to go and collect it, and uh, and we also had that um, uh, we had there was a machlokis between Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, where Beis Hillel were machmir, and they said hefker laniyim is is hefker says Beis Shammai, and uh, and and Beis Hillel say no, it, it's not it's not hefker. Unless it's uh, have got to, to Ashirim as well. Can anyone declare some a fruit or vegetable um, um, hefka? Can I just say, you know, all right, let me do this film and call it hefka, make it easy for them? Can somebody do that? If what? 
Did somebody just make, make anything Hefka? And any, you got, you can only make Hefka on your own produce. Right, but I mean, can they do it on, on, on any time? Is there- Yeah, any time. You can, you can declare something Hefka any time you want. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Can I take the cats, Hefka? Um, now that's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting thing because now that you said it, because like halakhically speaking, um, you would, you're still responsible for your, uh, for, a, for something that's a, that's a bore, even if you declare it hefka. So bore. for example, let's say you've got a, a giant pile of, uh, of bricks and you don't want them anymore. So you take them and you go and dump them in the street and you say, okay, these bricks are hefka. And meanwhile, somebody comes around the corner in their car and they drive into this pile of bricks and said, who put, whose pile of bricks is this? And, and you say, not mine, I have to. You're still chayev. Still chayev. Right. Still chayev as a bore. All right. Okay. Um, but uh, in terms of a cat, if you declare a cat to be hefka, um, are you still chayev as a mazik? Because it keeps coming back to your house and, uh, and, uh, and eating from you. Hmm. That's how far away you go. <laughs> I love. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't really, you can't really control this cat. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the cat comes in, goes out, whatever. Ah, I don't know. I, I don't, look, and in terms of an eater to keep friendly relations with your neighbors, it's still not going to help. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyway, um, right. then in terms of we're carrying on on the same sort of uh, you know, on the same sort of tangent of. Uh, of things that Chachamim agreed with and disagreed with. Uh, there were six things that, uh, think, six controversial things that Chizkiyahu did. The Chachamim said Shkoyach to him on three of them. And on three things, they did not say Shkoyach. They, they, they said you did the wrong thing. Gerer Atmos Aviv Almita Shel Chavalim. So his father was Achaz, who was a wicked king. And when his father died, instead of giving him a stately burial, he dragged his father's body to, uh, on, on a, a bed of ropes to, mm -hmm. to its grave to, in order to dishonor the corpse and show the people that, that Achaz's behavior was reprehensible and that he didn't intend to follow in it. Chachamim said, Shkoyach. Hodulo. Now remember the story in the um, with the with the nechash where the uh -huh. where there were the, the snakes and the asafsuk were complaining and then came these snakes and uh, um, and the people uh, and they were being bitten by snakes so they made this nechash nechoshes and the people you know looked up at the snake and uh, and then they were cured and. And what was the what was the thing? It wasn't was it the snake that cured? We have another Mishnah in this. It's not the it's not the snake that cures. It's when they lift their eyes to Shemayim and realize that they need a cure from from Shemayim. Um, but the problem was that in the time of of Chizkiyahu, the people the people they'd kept this nechash nechoshes from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, and people were starting to worship it as an avodah So they said, enough of this. You destroyed it. Mm -hmm. And Chachamim said, "Shkoyach." Ganas say the refus. Furthermore, he also um, hid away the the book of refus, which Chachamim thanked him for. Um, now, what's this book of refus? This is an interesting machlokes rishonim, because um, I think it's Rashi comes and says that it was a, it was a book of miraculous cures, and people were were coming to rely on it instead of uh, instead of davening to Hashem. And uh, and the Rambam comes afterwards and says like, he's he's absolutely aghast at Rashi's comment. He, he won't even name Rashi by name when he he says I've, I've heard it said in the name of a, a very wise person that this is because it was it was too good, and he says that's he says that's just absurd. It's, it, it, it couldn't countenance such a thing. Um, the Rambam says uh, if a person is hungry and he goes and, and he goes and eats bread. Right, he's gonna. He's then he's gonna stop being hungry. Does that mean that he should stop eating bread? Because other, then he's gonna stop uh, davening to Hashem for for his for his food. No, bread is bread is the cure for hunger. Medicine is the cure for sickness. 
Uh, so it, it's not, it, it cannot be that, uh, that this was a real set of refuas. It, rather, it was a book of quackery. It was a book of, of Dake, uh, of, of Dake Amori and all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things that, that people were, were trying uh, that, that, were, that didn't really help. And, uh, and he said, get rid of it. And that's why, and that's why it was a good thing to get rid of it. So that's, that's the Rambam according to his rationalist Chita, which I tend to appreciate. Anyway, there were three things that, uh, that Chachamim weren't so happy with Chizkiyo about. So when, when there were, you know, there was uh, hostile overtures being made by, uh, by the king of Ashur. So um, Chizkiyo, who sought to appease him, and he, he, he wanted to find a big gift of gold to send. So he scraped the gold off the temple doors. And he, took, and he sent it as a tribute to the king of Ashur. Chacham said that was a bad idea. You should have trusted Hashem. Okay. First place Second, in Mikdash. Hmm? First place in Mikdash. Yeah, this is first place in Mikdash. Um, During the siege, the Assyrians came and, and laid siege to Yerushalayim. So the, the water of the Gihon was coming out from Yerushalayim and, and out towards where the Assyrians were camped outside. And he said, you know what? Why are we giving them all this water? So he, he stopped up the, the flow that was going out so that they shouldn't have water. However, it also caused hardship inside the city because there were certain areas that, 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 lost, uh, that lost their water. And Chachamim said, bad idea. That you shouldn't have done that. You should have, you should have had the Amuna. Iber Nisan Benisan also, he... Declared, um, he declared an extra, an extra month um, of uh, in the year, um, in, in when it was already practically Nissan. Uh, normally, what you're supposed to do is, if you're going to make an extra Adar, it's supposed to be done in Adar. And this happened actually on the thirtieth day of Adar that he added an extra month. So it was basically already Rosh Chodesh, and he said, you know what, we need to. Add, it, 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 he he had all these cheshbonos because. Um, because the, the Kohanim were, were Tame and they needed more time to prepare. So he said, look, let's, let's put in an extra Adar, give people an extra month. And, um, but he did it too late. And the Chachamim were not happy with him doing this. Nonetheless, uh, what he did was done. Second, I think there's someone else. Sorry. You, have, uh, you have a nursery, uh, a, a gun outside your house or something? I heard. I hear all these. Uh, yeah, yeah. We got uh, there's a gun right next door. We've got you hear all the children whooping around in the background. That's right. Down from where you are, I hear. That's right. That's right. I, mean, I, knew, I knew it wasn't your kids. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. uh, we got one more. One more. So normally, the the morning tamid we know is is shechted early in the morning. Um, and uh, but but now we because we're dealing with uh, with Pesach, we're going to see what happens with, with the with the tamid when it comes into conflict with the korban Pesach. So the normal time for the korban tamid is uh, is at eight eight and a half hours into the day. Okay, so it's early afternoon. Mm -hmm. So six um, the seven the the first six hours are morning, the second six hours are afternoon. So here it's uh, the seventh hour. The seventh hour would be noon. The beginning of the seventh hour, so you basically an hour and a half into into the afternoon would be the time for the korban tamid. Okay, the karev b'teisha mechza. So the shechita would be at, at, at uh, let's let's just work in if, if in in terms of hours. If we had from six a.m. to six p.m. is uh, is a day and 12, 12 noon. So the normal time for the tamid would be to shechita at one thirty and to bring it uh, to bring the korban at uh, at two thirty. Okay. The uh, Arve Psachim, but on Erev Pesach, when you're going to have uh, all this uh, shechita of the Korban Pesach, and everyone is bringing their own personal Korban Pesach on one day, it's going to be a busy afternoon. Nishchat b'sheva umechza v'karev b'shmone mechza. So instead, you shech the the, the Korban Tamid at 12:30 and bring the Korban at 1:30. Bein bechol, bein b'shabbos, and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, on a on a weekday or on Shabbos because you're going to have the the same considerations. However, Chal erev Pesach liyos be erev Shabbos. So let's say Pesach is on uh, Pesach is on Shabbos itself, and and uh, and now you've got uh, 
you've got extra time needed because the roasting of the Korban Pesach has to be completed before nightfall. Okay, so uh, so so now we're going to have extra extra time pressure. Nishchat b'sheish mechta v'kar b'shev mechta. So here you we're already shechting the korban the korban pesach in um, in six and a half hours of the day. Oh, beg your pardon. I, I was I, I I gave it I gave you the wrong times. Shmone um, mechta would have so six six and a half. So six and a half would have been twelve is is twelve thirty. So there where they go to twelve thirty and and shecht it at one thirty. So the normal time. Would be uh, to shecht it at two thirty and 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 bring the korban at three thirty. Ere Pesach they bring it at at uh, at one thirty and uh, they they shecht at one thirty and bring it at two thirty. And if Ere Pesach falls on a Friday, then they shecht it at twelve thirty and bring it at one thirty. And then all all of the uh, all the people bring their korban Pesach. Okay. So it only takes an hour to roast a, uh, 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 an animal like that that size. Um, yeah, and it also has to be roasted whole. So they've got to, so they've got to move quickly. They've got to move quickly with the with the shechita. Then everyone's got to carry the the korban back to their homes and uh, and go ahead and start roasting. It must have been. I can't imagine what it must have looked like. Days of Migdash at that time. Just, just gosh, that would be incredible. <laughs> I mean, okay, it's not every individual. It's, it's groups bringing the korban pesach. Oops, still, it's that's still, that's a lot. Oh, okay, Olive Zion. Yeah. And today we have more people than they had then. So, oh yes, oh yes. So, I mean, I was I was yeah. trying to imagine what the what the korban pesach would look like today, and I just imagine that you've got. Okay, let's uh, let's say we've got um, five million people who would want to bring a korban pesach. Okay, just just in terms of order of magnitude, five million Maybe people want to bring a, a korban pesach. Five, five million groups, or five million, you know, because they go into groups. Yes, right. So now let's make groups of twenty in a group, shall we? Okay. Okay. So you've got 20 in a group. That means you're going to have uh, 250,000 groups. 250,000 people, each one bringing a lamb. And all the other preparation. That's, it's just it's so incredible. So think about yeah. it. Just, uh, it's a logistics. And I have a lot of Koanim on duty there. I'm sure. <laughs> just, just the logistics of it. Yeah. Wow. Well, Mitzvah Shem, it should happen. Mitzvah Shem. It's happening. Okay. Okay. Olive Zion. Reb Meir said, from their words, we infer that we may burn uncontaminated truma, which is comets, which contaminated truma on Pesach. Reb Yossi said to him, this is not an agalus. Um, no. I can't say the word now. Um, you know what I mean. <laughs> Even Reb Eliezer and Reb Yeshua concur that each is burned separately. Concerning what they do, they concerning what do they differ? Concerning suspended and contaminated truma, where Reb Eliezer says that each must be burned separately, but Reb Yehuda says, Reb Yeshua says that both may be burned together. As long as it is permitted to eat chametz, one may feed it to livestock, beasts, and birds, and sell it to a gentile, and deriving benefit from it is permitted. When it is when its period has passed, deriving benefit from it is forbidden. And one may not fire an oven or arrange with it. Rabbi Yehuda says there is no removal of chametz except by burning, but the Chachamim say he may also crumble it and throw it into the wind or cast it into the sea. Chametz of a Gentile over which Pesach has passed, deriving benefit from it is permitted. But chametz of a Jew, deriving benefit from it is forbidden, since it is said, nor shall leaven be seen with you. Erevin Gimel, Gimel. It's interesting because on a Rosh Kodesh, when all the schools come to the hotel, you can't even get up and down the stairs there anyway. Yeah. Have you ever been on a, on a Rosh Kodesh or a day when they have those stairs, you know, where you have to go through the security and all that? By the plaza? By where, sorry? By the plaza. You know, when you, you, go, you have to go through the gate, they have to put you Oh, yes. The yes, right. It's, it's already quite full there. Look, I mean, that's the plaza. The Harabias is much bigger than that. Right, right, I know, I know. But just the thought of all those, I don't know. And the mikvahs, they haven't even finished anything. 
Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And they all need masks, so that's the whole. <laughs> <laughs> it is permitted to place the slats close to the wall. Well, provided stop, that a cow. Stop, stop. Um, we're in base yeah. gimel. All right, I'm sorry. Oh, they turned the page a different. Oh. Rabbi Huda says until two base saws. They said they, they did not state two base saws except in regard to a garden or a kapef. But if it was a fold, a corral, a backyard, or a courtyard, even five korin, even ten korin, it is permissible. And it is permitted to place the slats at any distance provided one adds slats. If Yehuda says, if the general traffic passes between them, it must be diverted to the side. But the Kachaman say it is unnecessary. Whether a public cistern, a public well, or a private well, they may elect slats. But for a private cistern, they must elect a partition 10 fuckum high. These are the words of Rabbi Kiva. If Yehuda ben Bababa she, says they may not erect slats, excuse me? Oh. No, sorry, I'm just talking to my wife's student. Okay. If Yehuda ben Baba says they may not erect slats except for a public well, but for the others, they must erect an enclosure 10 fuckum high. Additionally, Rev. Yehuda ben Baba said, a garden or a copper that is 70, uh, 70 uh, cubits in a fraction by 70 cubits in a fraction and is enclosed by a fence 10 fuckum high, we may carry within it, provided it contains a watchman's hut or a dwelling, or it may near it, or it is near a city. Rabbi Yehuda says, even if it contains only a cistern, a ditch, or a cave, we may carry in it. And Rabbi Akiva says, even if it contains none of these, one may carry within it, provided that its area is 70 cubits and a fraction by 70 cubits and a fraction. Rabbi Eliezer says, if its length exceeds its width by even one cubit, we may not carry in it. Rabbi Yossi says, even if its length is double its width, we may carry in it. Okay. Master Shani. Now that I'm reading slower because of your story about grandma and uh, being eaten, or, uh, you know, <laughs> I was right. <laughs> um, okay, we have um, uh, Hey, hey uh, Tess. Yeah. If one's produce lay at a distance from him, he must confer upon it a name. It happened once that Rabbi Gamil and the elders were traveling on a ship. And Rabbi Gamil said, the tithe that I shall measure is given to Yeshua, and its location is leased to him. Another tithe that I shall measure is given to Akiva, son of Yosef, who shall uh, take possession of it on behalf of the poor, and its location is leased to him. The Yeshua said, the tithe that I shall measure is given to Eleazar, Eliezer, son of Azariah, and its location is leased to him, and they uh, received rent from one another. At Mincha, on the final festival day, they would recite the confession. How is the confession made? I have removed the hollow things out of my house. This is my Sashani and Netzeravai, and I have given them to the Levi. This is my, uh, my Levi, Levi, uh, Levi. And all also have given, this is Truma and Truma Maisra. To the strangers, the fatherless and the widow, this is my Sa'ani, Lechit, uh, Pichacha, Ashikacha, and Peya. Although they did not appear the confession out of my house, this is Hala. According to all your commandments, which you have commanded me, however, if he separated my Sashani before my Rishon, he cannot make the confession. I have not transgressed your commandments, and I did not separate from one kind for another, nor from the pluck for the unpluck, or from the unpluck for the pluck, nor from the new for the old, or from the old for the new. And I have not forgot it, forgotten, and I did not forget to bless you or mention your name over it. Just give me a second. Onwards. Nira. Nira, Tess Zion. Um, what is more saliva? Anyone who has not tasted anything, what is split bean water? Chewed split beans which were separated from their peels. What is urine? That which fermented. One must scrub the stain three times with each and every one of the detergents. If one applied these detergents out of the sequence, or if he applied all seven detergents simultaneously, he has not accomplished anything. For any woman who has a fixed period, her time suffices for her. And these are the fixed periods. She yawns or sneezes, or she feels pain in the area of her navel or in the lower abdomen, or she streams blood or a stream of shivering, a type of shivering takes hold of her, and so too familiar symptoms, similar symptoms. If, he establishes for her any, if she establishes for herself any of these symptoms three times, it is a fixed period. 
if she was accustomed to experience menstrual discharge at the beginning of the episodes, all the taros that she handled uh, from the duration of the episodes to tummy. If at the end of the episodes, all the taros that she handled for the duration of the episodes are tahor. Rav Yossi says, days and hours also are established at fixed periods. If she was accustomed to experience a discharge at sunrise, she's forbidden for cohabitation only at sunrise. The Behuda says the entire day is permitted for her. Okay. If she was accustomed That's it. That's, that's it. it. Yeah. I have um, uh, Chet Aleph. Yeah. Uh, this is a Bakora in regard to inheritance, who is not a Bakora in regard to redemption from a Kohen, one who is a Bakor in regard to redemption from a Kohen, and yet not a Bakor in regard to inheritance, one who is a Bakor in regard to both inheritance and redemption from a Kohen, and there is one who is not a Bakor either in regard to inheritance or redemption from a Kohen. Who is a bakor in regard to inheritance from not a? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Who is a bakor in regard to inheritance? Who is not a bakor in regard to redemption from a kohen? One who follows a non-viable fetus, whose head emerged alive, or a nine-month fetus whose head emerged dead. If she had previously aborted something resembling an animal, or a, a, a beast, or a bird, these are the words of Reb Meir. The common, however, say until he has something of a human form. If a woman aborts a sandal or an amniotic sac or an embryo which has begun to take, to take shape or if a fetus comes out in pieces, the child that follows any of them is a Bechor in regard to inheritance but not in regard to redemption from a Kohen. Right, because they, 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 they're, they're two different halachas. So for, for the for Pidyon Aben, it's got to be the Peterechim. So it's got to be the first thing that comes out of the mother's womb. But in terms of nachala, in terms of inheritance, why did the before gets a double inheritance? Because the you know the father's excited that this is now he's he's got his firstborn child, uh, and, and but he's not excited about a, a miscarriage of uh, you know a blighted ovum or something. You know, so so this is uh, so this is uh, it's still an excitement for him. So it's a, the two different halachas entirely at play. Okay, carry on. If one who had no children married a woman who had previously given birth, or if she had given birth when she was a slave and she was in, in, emancipated, or when she was a non-Jewish and then she converted, and after she became a Yisrael and she gave birth again, he is a Bakor in regard to inheritance, but not a Bakor in regard to redemption from a Kohen. Because again, he lacks the Peterechim, because the mother's already given birth. The Rosh Gili says that he is a Bakor with both in regard to inheritance and to redemption from a Kohen. As it is said, whatever opens a room among the children of Israel until they open the Israeli's room. Right, so, so if, she gave birth saying, when she was, when she, if she gave birth when she was still not Jewish, then that's not really a Peterechim be Israel. So, he, mm. so this child then will be the Peterechim be Israel, and, and he would be for a Kohen, but the halacha does not follow him, I don't think. It says yeah. over here that, uh, I think it does. So it's in that one. Does not follow Rabbi Yossi Agdili. No. Not where say that Rabbi Yossi is not in accordance with Rabbi Yossi Agdili. Okay. Uh, if one had, had children married a woman who had never given birth, or a, a woman converted while pregnant, or was emancipated while pregnant, or one who bore a child together with a Kohen's daughter, or with a Levi's daughter, or together with a woman who had already given birth, and similarly a woman who did not wait three months after her husband married and gave birth, and it is not known whether the child is a nine-month child of the former or the seventh-month child of the latter. He is a Bakor in regard to redemption from a Kohen, but not, not a Bakor in regard to inheritance. Right, so now this is a Peterechim for the mother, but it's not a Bakor for Nachala because we're not sure, because it's uh, not, you know, not clear that it's, that it's the father's son. Who is a Bakor both in regard to inheritance and redemption from a Kohen? If a woman aborts a mass full of blood, full of water, or, uh, or full of a variegated substance, or if she aborts something resembling fish, locusts, abominable creatures, or creeping things, or if she aborts on the 40th day, the, following of, um, the one following them is a Bakor in regard to both inheritance and redemption from a Kohen. It, wow, that's interesting. That right, goes up to the 40th day. Right. Uh, one delivered by cesarean section and one following him, neither of them is a Bakor in regard to inheritance or in regard to redemption from a Kohen. Reb Shimon says the first one is a Bakor in regard to inheritance and the second one in regard to the five Salem. Okay. okay. 
And last we have one more. One more. We're going to need to do Gimel. Really? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. If one's wife had not previously given birth and now she gave birth to two males, he must give five salem to a Kohen. If one of them died within 30 days, the father's exempt. The father died and the sons are alive. But Mayor says if they gave while they had not divided the state, it's given. But if not, they're exempt. And Yehuda says the state has become liable. If she gave birth to a male and a female, there's nothing here for a Kohen. Okay. Let me see if that. Um, uh, it's in Heivav. But if she gave birth to a, a, a male and a female, if the male. We don't know which one came out first, then the coin can't prove it. All right. He, okay. he, he, then the, the father can say, well, prove to me that the boy came out first. Right. They would have to have they would have to have aid them and all just to approve it, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, we have uh, Vav. There were no extortionists of, of, of land in Judea in the time of those slain by war. From the time of the slain at war and onward, there are extortionists there. How? If one board from the extortionist and then board from the owner, his purchase is void. From the owner and then from the extortionist, his purchase is valid. If he bought from the husband and then bought from the wife, his purchase is void. From the wife and then from the husband, his purchase is valid. This you is see the way. difference between them, by the way, is because if he goes first to the extortionist to purchase the property, and then he goes to the, 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 the rightful owner, and the rightful owner is what he's going to shrug and say, what, what can I do? This extortionist is forcing me to, to pay. But if he goes first to the rightful owner and says, listen, I want to buy this off you, and he agrees, and then he goes to the extortionist to pay him off, then, then we say that, that's legit. Right. Because right. he first got the permission of the rightful owner. And, the similar, and similarly with the husband and wife, when if the wife owns property, um, which, is, uh, which she's got the right to sell, then he has to, he has to negotiate it with her first and then, and then negotiate with her husband. The court that came after them said, one who buys from an extortionist gives the owner one fourth. When is this? When they do not have what, what to buy. But if they have with what to buy, they take precedence over any person. Re Rebbe convened the court and they voted and enacted that if it remains with the extortionist 12 months, whoever is first to buy it acquires. But, but if he gives the owner, but he gives the owner one fourth. Zion of deaf mute gestures and is gestured too. Ben Becerra, however, says he moves his lips and is communicated with by lips, uh, by means of lip movements in transactions involving chattels. Young children's purchases are purchases and their sales are sales and transactions involving chattels. Why, why, why is a cotton which is valid? What? Why is the, a young uh, child's uh, a cotton's purchase valid? Usually it wouldn't be, would it? Um, Right, so, so ch children who know how to do, you know, you've got um, children know how to okay. do business, how to do trading before they become bar mitzvah. Uh, so mekach is uh, they, they um, with metaltalin, with with like you know anything that's not land or slaves or staros or whatever they can they, they can trade as long as they understand they what they're doing. This is a yeah, this is this is Takanis Kachami Mishum Kade Chayav Shivne Mamikam Enomekach Lo Yim Kurulahim Mizonos Lo Yiknu Mehem. So then they won't, then you won't be able to buy or sell anything from the from the children. So they said it's basically a Tikkun Olam that they that they do in order to 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 give them permission to do trading. Uh, these things were declared at the in, in the interest of peace. A Kohen reads first, and after him a Levi, and after him a Yisrael, in the interest of peace. An Arab is placed in the same house as before, in the interest of peace. The cistern nearest the cha channel is filled first, in the interest of peace. Traps for bet, beasts, birds, and fish are covered by the laws of theft, in the interest of peace. The Biosi says it is actual theft. An article found by a deaf mute, a mentally deranged person, or a minor is current. Just, just to just to get that point there, like if a trapper puts out a net, right. and uh, and he catches a and let's say he catches a bird, now he he hasn't made a kenyan on it because the bird the, the 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 net doesn't make a kenyan. He's got to right. come and pick it up. So if he goes and puts out the net, and then somebody else comes and finds a bird, technically they could go and take the bird and say, hey, I'm I got it. So what? Right. Chachamim said, listen, darke shalom. 
if uh, we, we, we're declaring this to be gazelle, that if you take it from somebody else's net, it's not it's not yours. And Rabbi Yossi is saying that's actually that that's real gazelle. It's not just uh, uh, it's not just uh, just a durabanan. So the same thing about Matsya of a Kherishot of a Katan, because they don't have the das to be to be Kone. But uh, Chazal said, you know what? We're giving the, them the ability, ability to be Kone because of Darkei Shalom. Otherwise, they people are. would just like, take things and steal them out of their hands and say, ah, oh, you, you're, 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 you're a Katan. So you can steal the candy from the baby and say, hi, oh, you didn't really get that. It wasn't, it wasn't a Kenyan. An article found by a deaf mute, a mentally deranged person, or a minor is covered by the laws of theft and the interests of peace. Baby Yossi says it is actual theft. If a poor man is cutting at the top of an olive tree and to take what lies below him is considered theft in the interest of peace. Rabbi Yossi says it is actual theft and poor Gentiles are not permitted from collecting gleanings, forgotten sheaves or unpicked corners of fields in the interest of peace. Right, so we don't, right, we don't stop the, 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 the poor goyim from coming to collect uh, all right. the Maslah because Darke Shalom. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Have a great, Have a great day. day. Thank you. Okay, Bye. see. You.